Good morning. Well, welcome to Cross the Glory this morning. A special warm welcome to any visitors we have with us visiting this morning. Great to have you here. Great to be able to worship with you and share the joy of being God's children with you. Our service today, we continue in the season of Epiphany, and uh, we're talking today about how God reveals that Jesus is the Savior of the world and how as he reveals the salvation that we have through him, how he causes us also to shine with his own glory. And we'll talk more about what that means for us in our sermon for today. Zion will shine is the theme. So we'll begin with our opening hymn, O Love, How Deep. And we ask God to bless our worship this morning. Please stand if you're able. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins of life. I confess that I am by nature dead in sin. For faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. 
for the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of life, live in us, that we may live for you. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We pray. Almighty God, you gave your one and only Son to be the light of the world. Grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and believed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson for this morning is written for us in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12. He discusses here all the gifts of the Spirit, gifts which the Lord himself gives to us in And first and foremost, the gift of the Spirit himself, that he puts his Holy Spirit into our hearts to give us faith in him so that we can call Jesus our Lord. And then after that, we go on to to shine with all these gifts that the Lord gives to us as we serve him in our lives. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, But in all of them, and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. 
to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. This is the word of our Lord. Well, I'll join to sing responsibly Psalm 133 and 134. This time I'd invite the children of the congregation forward to hear the children's message. Good morning, all. I brought up here this morning a couple of items here. A little mirror. And this is a flashlight of sorts. Can I get a volunteer to hold this mirror for me? There you go, Asher. Thank you. All right. Now, what do mirrors do? Tatum? It shows you, okay, if you look into the mirror, you see yourself... You see yourself. Do you know why you see yourself when you look in a mirror? Titus? Okay, it reflects the way that you are, right? And we can get into all the, the sciencey stuff about it, but basically it, it reflects light, right? And so when there's light that bounces off of you, and then it bounces off the mirror, and so it shows the same thing on the mirror as the way that you look. And you can see that as you look in the mirror, right? Asher's doing that, and he's seeing himself, right? Now, let's test this idea that it reflects light. I'm going to turn this flashlight on, Asher, and can you hold it out for me, and then hold it straight towards me, okay? I'm going to turn on this light. It's kind of bright, so I... So I'll try not to... Yeah, there you go. Close your eyes a little bit. You see? Look at... Look right here. Can you see the flashlight? Yeah, sort of. It's back there. Now it's on the stone. Okay, so... You've probably done that before, right? Hey, let's do it for this side, too. They didn't get to see. Can you, you think you can point the mirror in that direction, Asher? And we'll just... Sorry, guys. There, you see it on the floor. Okay. Have you ever done that with a mirror? You've probably tested this yourselves before, right? You see how it, how it reflects light? All right. Well, mirrors aren't the only things that reflect light. In fact, everything reflects light. You can see the moon in the sky, right, at night. Does the moon shine with its own light? 
It doesn't. It's only reflecting the sun's light. That's why you can see the moon, right? And the only reason we can see each other right now is because we're all reflecting light. If there was no light in this room, if we're pitch black, we wouldn't see each other, right? So it's pretty cool that light reflects because it lets us see. Well, we're reading in our uh, lessons for this morning about how God makes us shine too. God makes us shine with his light, with his glory, so that other people can see who we really are. So who are we really? When we're talking about our relationship with God? We're his people, right? And so if we're God's people, we're going to act the way that God would want us to act. We're going to reflect his love to other people, right? And that's, what, uh, that's part of what we get to talk about today in our sermon. The other part is just the fact that we, we shine with God's glory at all. It's because God brought his salvation to us. And that makes us shine from the inside out because it makes us so happy. Because once we were not saved, once we were not God's children, but now we know that we are. So that's a wonderful thing that we get to remember and a wonderful thing we get to reflect to other people so that they too know that they are God's children and are saved. Okay, let's say a prayer together. Lord God, we, we thank you that you've brought to us your light through Jesus Christ and that you've assured us that, that we are saved and we are your children because of him. Help us to reflect that light to other people all our days. We pray in your name. You guys can head down to the tables or you can head back to your families and, and sit there. Asher, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. We continue with our verse of the day. Alleluia. He said to me, you are my servant in whom I will display my splendor. Hallelujah. Please stand, if you're able, for the reading of the gospel. The gospel for this morning is written for us in the book of John, chapter 2. This is the, the account of Jesus at the wedding at, of Cana. He performs his very first miracle here before the people. And his disciples were told, put their faith in him as a result. He, he showed them his glory, and so they trusted in him. But also interesting in this story is that, is that Jesus does this for we don't know who. You see, there's this wedding going on, a, a couple about to be married, but we don't know their names. We know nothing about them. And what a comfort then that, that Jesus goes to this wedding and gives these unknown people a very special gift. Right? No one is insignificant to Jesus. And that's comforting for us as well because Jesus, we know, pours out his gifts upon us too. He shines for us and helps us shine for him. We read. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. 
but you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn, The Church's One Foundation. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. How are you feeling this morning? Good. Excellent. I'm assuming that's the response I would hear from most people is something like, good, fine, okay, doing all right. But get past the surface stuff are you really feeling this morning? Or how are you really feeling at this stage of your life? Maybe some of you are feeling something like this. And even if you're not feeling like this right at this moment of your life, undoubtedly you have at some point, or, or you will again at some point. It happens not uncommonly that we feel lost, rejected, unwanted, unloved, uncared for. We worry, we get anxious, we wonder what's going to happen next. We have dark days, don't we, in this life? And those dark days can lead us to doubt even, even the love of our God, even the promises that he has made to us. 
And so it's fitting today that we get the opportunity to talk about a remedy to those dark days. You know, back in Old Testament times, people then had dark days as well, and, and our reading from Isaiah lets us know a little bit about that. Now, Isaiah the prophet, he's, he lived about 700 B.C. or so, and he had a really tough ministry. Maybe you know that. When God called him to serve as a prophet, he told to him, Okay, Isaiah, I want you to go to these people, these, these people of Israel, and I want you to tell them that they need to turn from their sins. I want you to tell them my words, but guess what? They're not going to listen to you. They're going to be always hearing, but never understanding. So imagine, imagine how Isaiah would have felt going into that kind of a ministry and knowing that, that people are just going to reject him at every turn. And so you even hear it a little bit right away in Isaiah's response to God. Isaiah asks him, okay, Lord, how long? How long do I need to do this? And the response was not encouraging. God responds and says, well, till the city lies in ruins, till nobody is left living there. That's how long. Oof. Tough ministry for Isaiah. His job was to continue preaching that message until people had rejected it for so long that God finally brought in that other nation of Babylon to flatten Jerusalem and carry the people off into exile. And Isaiah didn't even live to see that moment happen. A tough ministry for Isaiah. Certainly, we could see that he would have had dark days in his life. Well, and the people of Israel, too, in spite of the fact that they deserved it, right, for their rejection of God, they had dark days, too, when finally those Babylonians came in and carried them off into exile. They lost their, their homeland, the, the land God had promised them. And along with it, they would have started to wonder, well, what does this mean about our future? What does this mean about those other promises God had made, especially that promise about the Savior who was supposed to be born in this land? dark days for those people. But Isaiah didn't only get to prophesy about dark days. He also got to prophesy some amazing news, too. And that's actually where our reading comes from. That second half of the book of Isaiah is filled with gospel comfort for people who have seen dark days. And so we turn to these words, too, knowing that, yeah, sometime we face dark days. Maybe we're doing that right now, or sometime we will. And so these words are the perfect words to remedy the, that situation. So let's take a look at those words. The theme for today is Zion will shine. No matter how dark your days might get, God promises you, Zion, my people, that includes you, will shine. And God is determined to make this happen, first of all. And also we're going to see why this has benefit for us today. So our words from Isaiah chapter 62. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah. And we'll talk about those words in a little bit. For the Lord will take delight in you and your land will be married. As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. These are the words of our Lord. Now, interesting that God begins the way he does, saying, I will not remain silent, because those people of Israel, what did they deserve? They certainly deserved silence, right? After all, there are many sins against him. In fact, just a couple uh, chapters before this, Isaiah makes this comment about Zion, the Lord's people. He says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God. 
Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Finally, that's what the people of Israel deserved because they had forsaken their God, rejected him. They'd gone to worship other gods. And this was the warning to them. God is not going to hear you when you call. And yet now we hear at the beginning of our text, we hear God say, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet. God, God insists on continuing to speak. And so he continued to speak to the Israelites to give them the comfort that they very much needed in those dark days of theirs. He did everything that was necessary so that they would still know that God was loving them, taking care of them, and that he would still keep his promises to them. Cyrus the Great, maybe you've heard of him. This is someone else that God used to proclaim his comfort to his people. Because Cyrus, he was the one in charge when the Israelites were there in Babylon. And through Cyrus, God, God proclaimed to them a marvelous thing, that, that the Israelites were now going to go back to their homeland. Their years of captivity had been over, and King Cyrus was not only letting them go, he was sending them with his blessing. He was saying, I need you to go back to Jerusalem. I need you to rebuild that city. I need you to rebuild that temple to your God. Imagine, imagine how happy the Israelites would have been at hearing those words. Finally, somebody's on their side. Someone's sending them to do the very thing that they wanted to do for so long. You can picture the smiles on their faces, right, as they're gathering their things together. And we're told also that the, the people around them, their neighbors, they were giving them things for the journey, saying, yeah, blessings. Hope it goes well. Hope you succeed. Imagine the happiness. Imagine how they would have shown with joy. And then, of course, they get back to their homeland and, and, and they're reestablished there. And God finally, after time, after the time is right, he fulfills his greatest promise to them and he sends to them Jesus, right? Born in a manger, in the light of the world. And Jesus, shown for them to see as their God and Savior, told them why he had come to, to rescue them from their darkest days and from their darkest enemies. See, God did not give up on the Israelites. He kept on speaking to them to make sure they knew how much he cared about them and so that they would shine with his glory. And you know, he does the exact same thing for you and for me as well. Now, we don't deserve it either, do we? God's got his work cut out for us. This verse uh, kind of leads us in that direction again here, verse 4. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate. Now, that's what we were, right? We were deserted. We were desolate. We, we deserved that because we too have rejected our God by the things that we've thought, said, or done. We put ourselves before him. We've made ourselves then our gods. Rather than God is our God, we've fallen into the same sin of the Israelites then. And he deserves, or he has every right to, to hide his face from us. And yet, he doesn't. God still insists on speaking to you and to me. And we know how he does that, don't we? He does it on the pages of Scripture to us. We read through all of the history of the Israelites and we hear God speaking to us too. And maybe that's sometimes difficult to make that direct application. You know, you read like the story about Abraham or, or David and, and we, we read about them and we're like, yeah, that's a good story. I can see how God helped them out there, but what does that have to do with me? And yet, consider this, that for example, when God spoke to Abraham and he said, all nations on earth will be blessed through you. He gave him the promise of the Savior right there. He didn't say that just for Abraham's benefit. He said it to Abraham thinking at the same time, I'm doing this for you, Abraham, because I want those people sitting there at a cross of glory in church on Sunday morning, January 20th, 2019. I want them to know that too. That I sent the Savior through Abraham's family for them too. 
And we can make that same application to all the many Bible stories that we read. All of those words were meant for us just as much as they were meant for the people who first heard them. That's a wonderful thing. God keeps on speaking to you and to me, and he uses your pastors, he uses uh, your friends, he uses your families to keep on speaking for him, to remind you of the great love that he has for you, so that when you do have dark days, that you'll be ready to face them, that you'll still be able to shine in spite of it all. See, God is determined that you know that he wants you to shine with his glory, the glory of the salvation that he won for you through your Savior Jesus. Because you see, in spite of all the sins that we've done, God doesn't see us that way anymore, does he? No, he sees each and every one of us as he sees his own son, Jesus Christ, pure and holy in every way. And so, yes, you do shine. You shine as Christ himself shines, with that kind of perfection, that holiness. Okay, so what does that all mean for us? You've had this happen, I have no doubt. People come up to you, you've done something, you've done it well, Someone's like, hey, awesome job. That was just, that was perfect. It was just what needed to be done or needed to be said. It was exactly the thing that we were looking for. Thank you so much. Hey, words of affirmation, yeah? They make you feel good, don't they? They make you break out into a smile. They give you joy in your heart. It's awesome to be encouraged in that way. Do you see that that is exactly what God is doing here in Isaiah 62? I mean, just look again at the words that he uses there. And I'm starting at, at verse 3. He says, You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You will be a crown of splendor. God's crown of glory. Well, What's a crown for, right? The crown is what the king wears on his head. It marks him as the king, right? It, it gives him a, a look of majesty and splendor and, and glory. People respect him because he wears the crown. Do you get this? God says you are his crown. You are what he puts on his head so that he can mark himself as king of the universe. You are his glory. He takes great pride in you. Now, don't get me wrong, not because of anything that you have done on your own, right? He has given you the holiness of his son, Jesus Christ. And that is why he is proud of you. But you use that in your life. You live for him. And so, yes, you are his crown. And he wears you proudly. And he displays you to everyone he can to say, hey, look. Look at what my child did. What a great job. Isn't that awesome? That's how God rejoices over each and every one of his children for the sake of Jesus Christ. But not only that, he goes further than that. He talks more. He says, no longer will they call you deserted or your na name your land desolate, but you will be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah. For the Lord will take delight in you and your land will be married. Now those words, Hephzibah, that word actually means his delight is in her. Okay? And then Beulah actually means Mary. So there's a little wordplay going on here in that verse. Jesus talks about us as his very bride, right? And we hear about that in other parts of Scripture too, right? The church is the bride of Christ. We just sang a hymn about that as well. The church is one foundation. It talks about the church being the bride of Christ. But isn't it something that after all we've done to our God, all the ways we've departed from, from him, that he wants that kind of a relationship with us? 
And yes, it's imagery, right? God isn't literally marrying us, but, but he uses the, the image of marriage because that is the closest relationship that we know of in this world. Right? And it's that close of a relationship, you could say even closer of a relationship, that God wants with each and every one of us. That is amazing. That God would love us so much despite all that we've done. That he would go to the lengths that he needed to go so that he could take care of our sins. So that he could have that relationship with us. And then, then he continues by talking about how he feels about this wife of his. Yeah? He says, the Lord will take delight in you. As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. So imagine that again. God rejoices over you. He looks at the things that you do in your life, and he can't help but break out in a smile and say, that's my child, that's, that's my bride. And look at the things that he or she is doing all for me. What glory this person brings to my name. So brothers and sisters, yeah, we have dark days, don't we? But isn't this the very thing that lifts us right up out of those days? Because this is how our God feels about us. We are not unloved. We are not uncared for. We are not rejected by him. Quite the opposite. He loves us more than any of us could ever know. And he rejoices over us more than we could ever imagine. How awesome is that? And so, one day we're going to hear these words, right? Well done, good and faithful servant as he rejoices over all those things we've done. And so we're going to let our light shine in this world, aren't we? That glory that God has given us, the salvation that we ourselves shine with, the joy that that gives us, yeah, that's good for us. It benefits us ourselves. But it's also going to benefit other people. As, as we reflect the light of God's glory to others, they're going to see what we have. They're... They're going to wonder, how is it that you don't feel lost or rejected or, or unloved in whatever situation it is in your life? And you're going to be able to reflect that light and say, well, because I'm not. Because my God loves me. My God has not rejected me. He's accepted me. My God rejoices over me. How could I be sad in any situation? And through that, we pray that other people, too, will then light up with the glory of God and be another gem in his crown and another reason for him to rejoice. So, brothers and sisters, let your light shine. Shine with the glory that God gives to you. And may others shine with it as well. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll confess our faith now. We'll use the words of the Nicene Creed, reading it uh, as it's written there on the screens for you. The world claims everything evolved by accident, but what do Christians believe? We believe in one God, in the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. The world claims Jesus was only a noble and novel man. But what do Christians believe? We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. 
On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. The world claims all people have an inborn, godly spirit. What do Christians believe? We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with the song of the season. At this time, we'll bring our gifts of love to the Lord. stand as we offer our prayers. Accept the gifts of our hands and the thankfulness of our hearts, hearts, hands, and voices, all lifted in praise to you, God of our life. Amen. We include a number of people in our prayers this morning. 
Uh, first of all, Isaac Olverson, who had a successful surgery. His information has been in the bulletin for a number of weeks. Also pray for um, the, the Jeffers family, who uh, Gary's mother passed away uh, this past week. We also pray for Kim Poppenfuss, whose father is nearing death, and uh, for uh, Barbara Sousa, sister of Mary Lou Canna, Cannon, um, who uh, may, ha may have been diagnosed with cancer recently. So we go to our God in prayer. Jesus Christ, Lord of glory, you do light in making yourself known to us and others. Bring us to recognize and rejoice in your majesty and your ministry. In love, you chose to exercise your greatest strength to serve us in our greatest need. You revealed the brightness of your glory through humble deeds of love. You called ordinary men to do extraordinary things as your disciples and apostles. You also call us confidently to follow you, diligently to learn from you, and lovingly to imitate you. Equip and empower us to serve you and our neighbor faithfully. Use us as your witnesses to bring many throughout the world to the light of your gospel. Lord God, we offer our prayers on behalf of Isaac Overson and his family, prayers of thanks that you uh, were with the doctors as they completed uh, a complicated surgery, and, and that through that surgery he is now cancer-free. We ask that you would continue to be with him as he recovers from that and, and that you would continue to show him and, and his family your love and assure them that, that you are their God. Also, we pray for uh, the family of, of Gary Jeffers, whose mother passed away. We ask that you give them comfort during this time, the comfort of a sure hope of a, a reunion in, in heaven at the resurrection of the dead. And we thank you for the life that you gave to his mother and the, the opportunities that they all had to to enjoy each other's company and, and, of course, the opportunity she had to come to faith in you. We also pray for uh, Walter, uh, Kim Poppenfuss's father, who is nearing death. We ask that you would reassure him during this time of your love for him and uh, the salvation that he has through you. Also give strength to uh, Kim and her family as, as they weather these times. Reassure them of, of your love for them as well. And we pray also for uh, Mary Lou's sister, Barbara Sousa. We ask that you would be with her as she waits to, to hear what her prognosis is and, and ask that you would give her strength during this time. Remind her that you are with her and that uh, everything that happens in her life is, is ultimately for her good. Reassure her of, of the salvation she has in you and uh, um, uh, help others to encourage her as well. And Lord, we also ask that you hear us as we bring you our private prayers. Preserve your truth among us, and by that truth preserve us until you appear in dazzling splendor to bring us to the glory of heaven. Let our anticipation of the heavenly kingdom ennoble our thinking and speaking, enrich our conduct, and increase our joy in all aspects of earthly life. Hear us, light of the Gentiles, and the glory of Israel. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Yes, the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, good and right, so we it is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who rose from the dead in glorious triumph to bring forgiveness to the world and everlasting life to all who believe. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Oh, uh, no, come and sing. 
Blessed are you, O Lord of heaven and earth. We praise and thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, and we remember the great acts of love through which he has ransomed us from sin, death, and the devil's power. By his incarnation, he became one with us. By his perfect life, he fulfilled your holy will. By his innocent death, he overcame hell. By his rising from the grave, he opened heaven. Invited by your grace and instructed by your word, we approach your table with repentant and joyful hearts. Strengthen us through Christ's body and blood and preserve us in the true faith until we feast with him and all his ransomed people in glory everlasting. Amen. And we also join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he, when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated and come forward at the direction of the ushers if you are one in fellowship with our, our church here. Savior, strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven.
Please stand as we join to sing the song of Simeon. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We'll conclude with our closing hymn for the day. <laughs>